It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Patrick Tobin. Patrick Tobin is an insect ecologist who maintains a research program on the population dynamics and spatio spatiotemporal ecology of the insect, with particular attention to the effects of invasive species on native ecosystems, ecosystem services, and biodiversity. He also studies plant insect interactions and the role of climate change on insect seasonality and distributional ranges. He uses both field and lab based research approaches and quantitative approaches to better quantify the dynamics of the system he studies. So, we're really happy to have you here. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey, and thanks, Margaret, for organizing this invitation. I just got my spring quarter grazed in yesterday, so it's good to do something that doesn't involve grazing. Is, it, is that too loud? Can you hear me okay? Maybe I just go without it. Is that okay? Can everybody hear me? Okay, perfect. Yeah. I, I teach in a big classroom, so I'm used to projecting, so that's fine. Uh, so um, maybe let's use it. There we go. Well, that's not working either. Okay, what do I need to do here? I do that. Hmm. There we go. Okay. I think, it's, I, think I figured out. I'm a Mac user. Um, so we do know climate change has a lot of uh, projections, particularly not just to individual species, but also to communities and a regional landscape. And, and we've all seen different projections that, that assume different levels of mitigation from next to nothing to something more aggressive. And I actually like to use that happy center projection because it's kind of in the middle point. So I often use that as some of my model projections of how it affects different communities. And it is actually, you might have heard of them referred to as cold blooded, which is really a bad term because sometimes your blood is actually quite warm. <laughs> Um, poikilotherm is a better term, and it really refers to the fact that they, they don't maintain, like we do, a, a constant body temperature. Um, there's some advantages to that in that they can tolerate a pretty wide range of temperatures uh, from something close to 100 degrees plus all the way down to something like 5, 7 degrees Fahrenheit. So having that ability to, to alter, the not, not put the metabolic costs or invent, uh, resources into maintaining a body temperature, possible body temperature and having advantages, but it also means that they're particularly sensitive to changes in climate. And uh, not too surprising, if you think about their metabolic processes, they tend to follow some sort of curve that looks like this. And this is a kind of a generic curve that's applicable to a lot of temperate species. Uh, the same shape of curve would work for tropical species. It would just be shifted more to the warmer temperatures. You could also have a boreal species that has the same kind of shape, but it might be shifted more to the colder temperatures. And uh, this is just for developmental rates. So this is larval development or nymph development and so forth. But the same kind of temperature uh, constraints also affect things like egg laying, adult maturation, and so forth. Uh, all has a similar curve. And within this, they, they have an optimal temperature, just like we kind of do. We have what we call a thermoneutral zone, right? That's our, our temperature at which we don't have to sweat. We don't have to uh, ch uh, have these chills. And we all have different thermoneutral zones. My wife certainly has though, quite a bit of different thermoneutral zone than I do. Um, but we all have certain ranges that we're comfortable. And so insects have this optimal temperature where these processes are maximized. And they tend to be, again, in temperate systems, about 28, 30 degrees centigrade. So that's about what, 82, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if you notice beyond, on the, beyond the, on the, well, <laughs> left or right, whatever, uh, below the optimal temperature, you see a wide range of what we call suboptimal temperatures. And it tends to range quite a bit, uh, more so than on the high end. So the range over which insects can tolerate temperatures above that optimal temperature tends to be fairly restricted. So you can imagine if you're an insect living in some different area, uh, where you are living currently, like where are you on this curve, has a lot to do with how you're going to tolerate different climate changes. If you're already living at your optimal temperature, then going warmer is going to be a bad thing. If you're below the optimal temperature, getting warmer may not be such a bad thing. It might actually be a good thing. So some common questions we think about 
When we think about uh, climate change and insects, knowing that insects are so integrally tied to temperatures, will they expand their range? And we had a very, very good example of, of range expansion here in our area with the mountain pine beetle, particularly in British Columbia and more recently in Alberta. Um, some of the fires that have been burning up in BC and Alberta are a direct consequence of standing dead um, lumber, or, or lumber, but standing dead trees in that area. And uh, this is a native species. It's been uh, evolutionarily adapted to feeding in those those kind of climates and those kind of, um, of, of of tree conditions, and but it's always been restricted to you know below the um, on one side of the Rockies as well as below the 60th parallel, and uh, it has gone through several outbreaks. Bark beetle outbreaks tend not to follow any kind of cycle because they tend to be age specific. Uh, in that they require certain ages of trees to really develop under a thicker foam layer. Uh, that's quite a bit different than defoliators. And they also are tree killing insects. In fact, they're in the genus Dendrochinus, which is actually Greek for tree murderer, <laughs> which is very appropriately named. So they're, they're one of these groups of bark beetles that we call primary species in that they attack uh, live trees. That's their, that's their home. Uh, some attack dead trees, we call those sort of janitor species, but some attack live healthy trees and where they can attack uh, live healthy large trees, 80 plus years old, they have that flown thickness that allows them to, to do quite well. They also use a mass attacking strategy um, where they attack the tree uh, with semiochemicals. So they all sort of go after the tree at the same time not too different than a yellow jacket. So a lot of you, how many people have been stung by a yellow jacket? How many people have been only stung one time by a yellow jacket? Yeah, you're lucky, you must have been fast because you, you do, because usually when they, when they sting you, they actually eject you with an alarm pheromone that allows her sisters to know, oh, you're the threat and they go attack you. That's right. So bark beetles have a similar strategy in that when they find a good tree, they're releasing chemicals and they're calling in others to say, I got one, <laughs> come help me. Uh, the tree is not entirely defenseless. Uh, it actually produces uh, a lot of different chemicals, including these pitch tubes that uh, turn into amber one day uh, and that's and, uh, a defensive mechanism. And sometimes the tree wins, but during these outbreak conditions, the tree usually loses yeah. and yeah, the bark beetle wins. So historically, bark beetle outbreaks have occurred. This is a, a work from our colleagues north of the border at the University of British Columbia, as well as the University of Alberta. And there's been several outbreaks through history that, uh, um, that we know just from aerial records, uh, probably longer. It's, it's hard to construct a dendrochronology record of bark beetle outbreak because they kill the trees. I'll show an example of how we could do it with the foliators. Uh, so historically, it's been sort of restricted on the west side of the Rockies, you know, certainly far below the 60th parallel, which goes into the Northwest Territories. And then all of a sudden, in this outbreak that really started in the late 90s and went all the way to about 2014, uh, right when this paper was published, they saw a couple of things. They, once they saw it, one, they, they saw it go over the Rockies, which had historically had not thought to have happened. And they actually did get it into the Northwest Territories, which is right at the 60th parallel for a short period of time. And one of the reasons was that, uh, the, the main, a main reason was that winters were no longer as cold. This particular beetle um, can survive the winter at about negative 40, which is really easy to convert because negative 40 C is the same as negative 40 F. They converged at negative 40. Um, and this is able to tolerate around those kind of temperatures before it, it dies. And uh, historically winters were a little bit colder. So there was enough winter mortality to sort of keep the beetles in check. And over many years, as, as winters got warmer, they weren't getting those sub, um, uh, those lethal temperatures, more and more of them were able to survive the winter that historically had been killed, which led to this, this great expanse. So we've seen good examples of, of insects responding very favorably to climate change, in part due to these warmer winter conditions and the ability to survive some of these extreme warmer conditions. Doesn't always work that way. Uh, another species that we don't have here, at least permanently, but we do trap it, uh, we, the Royal We, but Washington State Department of Agriculture, Oregon State, or Oregon State Department of Agriculture, 
are the main state agencies that monitor for this. You might have seen these traps. Uh, this is alignment tree at this far. I know it's not going to help, but well, in North, so it's above in North America, it says alignment tree at this far. Uh, this is now known as a spongy moth. And it's, it was first introduced uh, in 1869-ish by an uh, amateur entomologist just outside of Boston, and it's been expanding its range quite a bit. Uh, it's a species I work with quite a bit. I work up so much, I'm actually contaminated with the sex pheromone, so the males fly to me, uh, which is why I had I used to work in the in the east, and I had to move out west because I couldn't take it anymore. I felt like pig pen from the the. The cartoon where these moths were always flying around me. So anyway, but uh, then I should. Sorry. Thank you. So I, now I'm like a mobile trap for the, for the Washington State Department of Agriculture. But you might have seen the traps that were uh, that have been placed here and there. Um, it goes with a pretty remarkable outbreak. That's a picture of a horse in uh, Ohio. That was, I don't know if you can tell from the picture, but it's, it's loaded with caterpillars crawling up of it. So in addition to being in a, a forest pest in that it can cause mortality, um, it also can be a big nuisance factor as well. One of the earlier studies, it's probably fine. Oh, there, oh, you fixed it. Oh, thanks, Stacy. One of the uh, earlier studies on, um, let's see, can I click that? Oh, Maybe, I, oh, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, there we go. I'm back the, that's perfect. Okay. So one of the one of the earlier studies on where can this insect live based on plants. So like all insects, it has that temperature dependent curve. There are temperatures that are too cold. There are temperatures that actually are too hot as well. And one of the first studies was done by David Gray, who used uh, 30 year averages from 1960 to 1990. Which nowadays I think we sort of frown on the idea of using 30 year normals because uh, you look at 30 year normals and like every day is nice and it rains a little, right? That's my, that's the best description I have for 30 year normal. But the time it wasn't a bad thing to look at. And what he did was project this climate suitability map for North America, uh, excluding Mexico, where it's thought to be way, way too warm. And what do we see? Well, the blue areas are areas where it's just too cold. And you can, uh, or, or I'm sorry, the blue areas are areas where it's not thematically suitable. And where you see a lot of the blue areas is, are up north because the winters are too cold for the insect to survive. That makes sense. You also see in the higher elevations, you see the, the Cascades, you see the Rockies. You also see South Florida <laughs> and South Texas, which I assure you are not too cold. It's the inverse. It's thought to be actually too hot, where they're actually way above that optimal temperature. The development rate is quite slow. Um, and in some cases, they actually don't have those cues to sort of wake back up for winter as well. A lot of insects will respond to a cold cue during winter to say, okay, winter's here. Now I can start waking up again. And, and as you look at this, we can look at a couple of different regions. We can look at uh, northern Minnesota, the Arrowhead. Anybody been in the Arrowhead of northern Minnesota? The Boundary Waters, it's a pretty cool area. If you get a chance to go to the Boundary Waters, it's pretty, pretty magnificent. It's that Arrowhead part of Minnesota that uh, is, uh, well, I can try to use this. Well, maybe I can't try to use this, but that's okay. But you see that blue triangular section of Minnesota, and, and that was thought to be way, way, way too cold. And, uh, and then you can also look at, I want you to look at North Carolina, Virginia, which looks to be fairly suitable. We'll talk about those two areas. The first area we will talk about is Minnesota. Uh, here's our arrowhead. And I had a chance to, to sort of monitor this very early on. And, and uh, we always saw it, when I say we, I, at the time I was working for the US Forest Service. And at the time we always saw, oh, we don't have to worry about Northern Minnesota, it's too cold. And I, I've been up there many, many times. I've been up there in, in May when it was still snowing and there was like three feet of snow still on the ground. And, and all of a sudden I was getting these emails from colleagues with the Michigan or the Minnesota State Department of Agriculture thinking, and they were saying, hey, we're catching moths in our traps. Is that, is that even possible? And I'm like, well, I guess it's possible because they do, they can get blown through these winds along Lake Superior. And so they're probably just blowing in from Wisconsin or, or the UP of Michigan. So blame those folks. And then, 
And then after a time, it was like, well, we're still catching them and we're catching them late enough where phenologically, they don't seem to be synchronized with what we think the phenology is in Minnesota, or I'm sorry, in Wisconsin or, or the UP. And then they started buying egg masses, which is really kind of cool because the females don't fly in this species, only the males do. Females are basically born pregnant, just like tribbles if you watch Star Trek. And, and all they need is a male to, for fertilizing. So they release a sex pheromone, which is what's contaminated in my body. And the males fly that sex pheromone and mate with the female. Uh, and as the eggs are laid, they're fertilized with sperm. The females don't fly. So when you start seeing egg masses, that's telling you, I think they actually might be here because they didn't fly in and so forth. And sure enough, when you looked at the kind of the scaling uh, over time, we started seeing these consistent patterns. And it really did wake our wake us up with the fact that, oh, we are seeing climate shifting in Minnesota that is allowing this invasion to occur that previously climatically was not thought to be possible. So another good example of, of an insect res responding favorably to warmer temperatures. However, at the same time, I was getting calls from colleagues in Carolina and Virginia with the opposite problem, but a good thing in that, hey, we're not catching these things anymore. Where did they go? It's like, are we, is it, is, are we using the right lure? Or are we, do we have a contaminant that, that's not working because our traps aren't catching anything anymore? Uh, and we feel like we're missing something. And then the initial thought was, there must be something defective with the lure. Uh, the traps are baited with this lure. The sex pheromone is a synthetic compound uh, and it works really well, uh, <laughs> obviously. I haven't touched this stuff in, in a long time and I'm still contaminated. And there are people that haven't touched this stuff in decades that are still contaminated. So the original thought was, okay, let's go back to the lure manufacturer and do some quality control. The lure was fine. And it turned out that when we modeled it, it was actually getting too warm. And in these areas that were, again, once thought to be climatically fine, were now turning into climatically unsuitable areas and actually were going backwards which was great for the state because they could sort of say, hey, we're doing, we're doing our job. Uh, the reality was they probably were doing some good, but they also were benefiting from warmer temperatures. So here's a case where it was responding favorably in one area, but also negatively in one area. And that sort of underscored really what we think what will happen now with, with insects in their range. It was once thought that, oh, warmer temperatures, insects are gonna have this great time at this. Well, the reality is, as, as certain areas get warmer, uh, that might be a good thing, depending on where you live and depending on where you are in that curve, but it also could be a bad thing, depending on where you live in that and where you are in that curve. So you think about it as windows that are open up in certain areas, maybe up in northern areas or at higher elevations, they might be closing. And we might be seeing uh, the previous talk to, uh, speaker talked about assisted migration. Well, this isn't assisted migration, but this is the same idea where it's shifting in response to the climate change and how that affects uh, other trophic interactions remains to be seen. But we should expect to see more of a shifting occurring as certain windows open and certain windows close. Another question. Will they get worse? This really applies to pest populations, but uh, you know, over a million described species of insects, less than 1% are thought to be pests. And they're only pests because they interfere with what we want. <laughs> they either eat our food or crops or so forth. So very few of them are actually pests, but it still is a, a legitimate question. Will they increase in population? And really a, a, a wonderful example, actually we have to go across the pond and look at this uh, large bud moth. Um, which is in the same family as our western spruce bud worm. So a really cool insect that goes, this is one that goes through these really nice periodical outbreaks. Uh, defoliators are not generally leaf or tree killers, although they can if they defoliate a tree year after year, particularly if the tree is predisposed, um, which in a way is interesting because it means they leave a record of the potential damage that you can actually ascertain from a, a dendrochronological, dendrochronological record, which I'll show shortly. So this goes through the periodical uh, uh, outbreaks, native species to Europe, these on large, hence the name, large bud moth. And there was a really, really cool study a while ago uh, that was able to ascertain 1,200 years of outbreaks. And they, were, they did it in a couple of different ways. One, this is all done in sort of um, uh, the Alps uh, of Switzerland. 
And one way they were doing it, they were able to core living trees and date them and go back several hundred years. And uh, because there's a lot of homes like this, this cabin or whatever, uh, where they know when it was built, so they know the cabin was built in 1800 or something like that. Uh, they could then core those trees and large is a very common economically used wood. They actually were able to core the houses. That's what that gentleman's doing. He's actually coring a house where we know where they know when it was built. They know it was large. So they know the large was killed about the time, you know, cut down about the time it was built. And they could actually go back even further in the record. And then, you know, some of these trees were like going back a thousand, a thousand years. And what they found based on the dendrochronological record, uh, during periods of outbreaks, you tend to get reduced tree growth, right? Makes sense. But uh, you also get reduced growth in like a drought year and so forth. You get good growth, maybe following a fire where that tree has been released and they don't have competition anymore, but you get all these different patterns. And, and what they were finding, finding was these really regular patterns that did correspond more recently with the historical pattern of large bud moss defoliation. Well, the motivation of the study was not that. The motivation of the study was starting in the 80s, uh, early 80s, uh, no one could find this thing anymore. You know, it was like it sort of went away. In the 90s, it's like, where did large blood moth go? It used to outbreak every 10 years, pretty like clockwork. Uh, and it just disappeared. And then finally said in, in the early in, in the mid 2000s, they said someone should look at this because this is this thing extinct <laughs> now. It's like where did it go? And they still found these low level populations. But what they found was this was an insect that did not respond. It was already living probably near the edge of what it could tolerate. And with warming weather, it actually went away. Now, if you're growing large for economic purposes, you might say, you know, woohoo, what's, what's the downside? But um, unfortunately, a, a big uh, component of outbreaks ecologically is that they do provide a lot of food for wildlife. And, uh, and when you see the disruption like this of a native species being removed from an ecosystem, there are certainly going to be consequences to that. So this is one that has still, had not, still has not come back. They can still find sort of really low level populations, but 81, what is it, 2023, they still have not seen these outbreaks return. They probably never will. Another really cool study also from uh, Europe in Bavaria looked at five different species uh, that feed on pine. For the most part, they all were feeding on Scots pine, uh, kind of a native tree species. And, and uh, four of them, the first four are uh, basically caterpillars. They're moths. Uh, they, they all turn into some sort of moth. And the last one, number five, is actually a wasp. It's a sawfly, so it turns into a wasp eventually. But they all feed on pine. Actually, sawflies are thought to be the first uh, evolved uh, hymenopteran. So they were far, be far before bees, for example. Um, and they stayed on conifers, not, not um, maybe somewhat surprising. Not all of them did. Some sawflies will feed on deciduous trees, but uh, a lot of, lot of sawflies stuck with conifers, uh, which is what was around when they first evolved. Uh, anyway, five different species, all competing for pine, um, all of kind of occurring at the same time. Phenologically, they, they kind of overlap in time and space. And there was a long-term study that looked at their, their severity based on uh, uh, field work, aerial detection, and so forth. And what they found was just a wide range of how they were responding to climate. Uh, some were, were loving it, <laughs> for example, the sawfly and the five. Uh, loved it. It became more frequent. It was doing more damage to the trees. Uh, others, not so much. Like number four, it actually was going away. And as a consequence, the severity was going away. Uh, some had no change whatsoever. Uh, actually, Lima tree of Manaka is actually a congener of the spongy moth that's native to Eurasia. Uh, that one wasn't affected at all and so forth. And so what this really kind of underscores is that, again, depending on where you're living, and where you are on that curve, knowing that those curves can, can be shifted slightly, even for temperate species, it really had a lot to do with who was benefiting and who was not benefiting. So it's hard to answer the question, will they increase in population? Well, who's they, <laughs> right? <laughs> we don't know. I mean, depending on the species, where it's living, uh, there's just too many, too much variation. And we also recognize that, well, some are obviously benefiting, um, some are not benefiting very well. Uh, one thing that was interesting from Bavaria 
was that uh, during these outbreak conditions, these really high density populations, there wasn't any change in the overall severity, which may be a good thing. In other words, as one species was being removed, something else was just taking advantage of that open space, um, which was a good thing. So it wasn't like the outbreaks were getting worse in this case. Uh, there are examples where outbreaks have gotten worse, particularly in the mountain pine beetle example. This was a case where, you, you know, woohoo, my competitor is gone, <laughs> so I can take over that space. Um, but that was a good thing, I guess, if you're thinking about long-term management of NATO ecosystems. A big question is, we don't know how non-native species interact. Um, they're completely different in different boat. And not all non-native species are um, invasive. Uh, some are, well, the, the European honeybee certainly isn't invasive. Uh, uh, well, depending on who you ask, depending on where you put them, <laughs> they could be considered invasive, but certainly they have a big economic input uh, in, in terms of traditional agriculture. Uh, but even the ones that are not invasive, which is actually most non-native species are, are not invasive, they still are inactive, interacting with what we call novel host trees, so host trees that did not co-evolve to deal with that kind of level of damage. We don't know how that's going to interact yet. That's kind of a uh, two things going on, one climate change and one interacting with novel host plants. Another question we might ask is, well, how is it going to change species interactions? This has been primarily, well, not primarily, but um, a lot of interest in understanding species interactions with regard to plant and pollinators, right? Particularly those specialist pollinators that may only go after a few plants, and in turn, that plant relies on those pollinators for successful pollination. And and on one hand, I mean, we know, we kind of think that if you think about the, the seasonality of insects and the seasonality of plants, I think about spring, uh, you know, flowers come out at a certain time and flowers shift, you know, flower timing has been changing. Uh, and with warming temperatures, it makes sense that they both will come out sooner, right? And we, we've seen patterns of that. Uh, there was actually this really wonderful study from, I think, uh, another, from the University of Minnesota where this, uh, professor who, um, just for the heck of it, used to, uh, I guess, on his way to class uh, over a 50-year career, apparently, he would write down when different different flowers on campus were blooming, just for the heck of it, just for his own record. And then he passed away. And then they were cleaning out his office, and someone found this data set that he had been collecting for 50 years that had all these flowering times on campus uh, and when they were blooming and so forth. And they put it together and said, oh, you know what? Flower bloom times are getting, they're coming out sooner. And it was kind of a cool, almost was thrown away, you know, because often when you retire, they just sort of dump everything in your office in the garbage, the dumpster, almost was thrown away. And it turned out to be this wonderful data set. So we do know that plants will come out sooner, bloom times will happen sooner. And we, we also know that insects will come out sooner as well. What we don't know is that, will they come out sooner at the same rate? Uh, they do respond to temperature, right? <laughs> uh, but plants tend to use photoperiod more. Uh, insects don't really care about photoperiod, they're just temperature. So how do they respond uh, given that we have warm temperatures? And I was very fortunate to be involved in some early studies at the space site, which is now defunct. It was, it was started up in Rylander, Wisconsin. Um, and it was one of those, it was started up with a uh, congressional earmark. Remember when we used to have earmarks? And those kind of went out of favor for good reason. And this was a product of one of those earmarks that was uh, championed by this uh, congressman from Wisconsin, uh, uh, Congressman Obi. And two things happened. Obi retired and, and earmarks kind of went away. So this, this space site that they had spent, I don't know how many million dollars building, uh, was, was no longer funded and, and went defunct. But before it went to funk, uh, it was a wonderful place to look at these control conditions. What does happen to trees in these increased temperatures? There were also increases in ozone in some of the rings. And it was really one of the first that looked at climate change in woody plants. Um, there were other phase sites that looked at like soybean growth and agricultural crops, but this was a much bigger project. So those are all tree rings. Uh, and the, with the rings are uh, within the rings are I'm sorry, not through the rings and within the rings are trees growing and they're growing different species uh, typical of northern hardwoods hardwoods up in up in that area uh, things like basswood and um, you know different quaking aspen and birch and 
mostly paper birch. And, and with those rings, you could manipulate the conditions. You could increase temperature, you could increase ozone. And I was fortunate to work on a study where we were increasing temperature with regard to another native species, uh, the forest head caterpillar. And we were looking at forest head caterpillar, how it was gonna respond to spring hatching, you know, hatching from eggs in the spring, and how that related to the, the leaf out of two of its hosts, uh, aspen and birch, mostly quaking aspen and mostly paper birch. And what we found was, uh, if you look at the, the, the mean ring temperature, that was the, the fluctuation of the temperature rings that we were able to do, and it's sort of on a continuous scale, and uh, ambient being, uh, ambient basically we just left alone, we just let the winter of Wisconsin handle it, and then we artificially raised temperatures. Uh, we actually did, a, I'm showing 1.7 and 3.4 at the time, those were the, the B1 and the A1 temperature climate scenarios. And what you see, and then we have calendar date, and what you see that in all three species, they all come out sooner, all right? So as it got warmer on the x-axis, the calendar date at either the eggs hash or bud break uh, occurred, it all came out sooner, which makes sense. We're warming it up, things are progressing a little bit sooner. And what you see under ambient conditions, here you have this native species that's co-evolved with two host plants in this area, uh, aspen and birch, although again, it's mostly quaking aspen, mostly paper birch. And what you see is that this insect has really well selected to interact with those two host species. If you come out early, uh, you're able to feed on birch. If you come out a little bit later, no problem, you can feed on aspen. So it's sort of a, it's this co-evolved system. What happens when you increase temperature? Well, what, one thing that happened is if you notice, birch becomes no longer uh, uh, available from a, seasonal, uh, a seasonality perspective. In other words, uh, birch is already done, it's staying, and then the caterpillars come out. Now, why is this important? Well, when they come out as caterpillars, they're very, very tiny, which means they have very, very tiny mouth parts, which means they can't eat mature leaves. Uh, they need to be very, very well synchronized with that first leaf out. And there's a lot of advantages or a lot of uh, uh, trade-offs between how you do this if you're an insect. On the one hand, you can come out a little bit earlier before bud break, which is what most insects do. And that way they're hanging out. And as soon as those leaves come out of the bud, they can eat those nice, highly nutritious, often fully defended leaf tissue and also mechanically chew them with their smaller mouth parts. Um, you also run the risk of getting killed by a fall spring, like when you get a frost the next week, but that's okay. You, you still, there still could be advantage. You could also try the other way, other strategy and come out later, which means you may be less likely to be killed by a, one of these frosts that occur out of nowhere. Uh, but it also means you might run into the case where you have less tissue available to you. So what we see it, if you raise it up to 1.7, Couple of things. One, they're really nicely synchronized with aspen. Not a bad thing, but birch is no longer a component in that system. If you go up even further, uh, you start to see a decoupling. Where all of a sudden this species is coming out so late that its two main hosts are no longer available. So we do see this idea where, yes, plants and insects are both responding, but if they respond at different rates, it does have some consequences to the trophic interactions. And there's actually a whole hypothesis named after this called the phenological window hypothesis that says, hey, there's a window of opportunity between these spring emerging insects and whatever plant. And it, in this case, I showed an herbivore example, uh, but it, it could also be very critical in, in pollinators. You know, when are pollinators coming out, particularly if they're coming out with warming temperatures but responding to temperature only, and maybe their host plants coming out with warmer temperatures could also respond into photo period. It could have a lot of consequences toward decoupling these interactions. It could also have uh, ramifications across these larger food webs as well. Okay, so I talked quite a bit about climate. I wanna sort of switch gears and talk about drought. <laughs> Another thing we're getting more used to uh, uh, in the Pacific Northwest and, uh, you know, you, we used to all water our gardens, you know, water our tomatoes, water our peppers, and now we're doing that, and now we're like watering our trees, right? I, mean, I know I am more. I've lost a couple of hemlocks over the years. I live in Snohomish County, and uh, I'm now watering my trees <laughs> as well. It's like it's not just about the tomatoes. 
And, and you know, historically, this is going back to 1895, so not that historically, uh, but we see these, these ebbs words, we get wetter years, drier years, and so forth, and we have been in more of a drier period, not too, not too surprising uh, at all. And there's a lot of research on the role of drought. Uh, this is not a new thing, uh, the role of drought in insect outbreaks. And one thing drought does, we all know, it stresses plants, right? And stressed plants are less likely to be able to defend themselves. Uh, plants do two things with two broad things with pho uh, through photosynthesis. One, they produce primary metabolites, which they use in, in growth and reproduction. They also produce what we call secondary metabolites, which is used for everything else. One of which <laughs> is defending yourself, either producing uh, like pitch, which is a defensive mechanism of conifers, as well as producing uh, chemicals. In fact, a lot of our early, actually a lot of our insecticides are still based on plant compounds. Uh, so there's this trade-off between the two. So when you're stressed out, when you're stressed due to drought, you actually become more likely to be susceptible to herbivores. And we, during the uh, 2015 and so forth, there are all kinds of cases where trees are drying across, and not just trees, but also sword ferns and uh, Seward Park. Uh, and initially, when you start seeing tree dying, you think, oh, there must be a new thing going on, a new pathogen, new insect, <laughs> emerald ash borer in the case of uh, the Midwest and so forth. And, and that's exactly what the first thought was. Like, it must be some biotic agent. In some cases, it could be. Uh, there's my student, Ryan Garrison, working on his PhD, uh, not in that picture, but uh, in this case, that was an insect, a native insect, wrong first borer that was taking advantage of stressed trees and, and killing a lot of, particularly the non-native bird species. Western sword fern uh, was really as much, and I, was, I remember looking for below ground herbivory as a possible effect, and I really do think it came down to drought. Drought conditions were just killing it. So we do know drought can be a pretty powerful killing agent, even in the absence of any kind of biotic agent. That kind of brings me to a nice case study, and that's big leaf maple. And it's got a, a, a range that, that tends to follow uh, coastal Pacific Northwest. There are actually some pockets on the, on the south side of Lake Chelan, uh, where it's a little bit uh, south-facing aspect. And you actually will find big leaf maple further away from the Cascades, but mostly restricted to the, this side of the Cascades. And uh, has a lot of uh, ecological services. Uh, Commercial, uh, it is used in, in pianos and so forth, but as, as Stacy knows, they're actually using it uh, for big leaf maple syrup, which I don't know if he's had this yet, but there's actually really, um, I'm not sure it's the best for pancakes, but it's really good on ice cream. I will say that, right? Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah. It's also good in a cocktail too, I suppose. But uh, Stacy said, yes, that's what I get. <laughs> um, but it has a lot of, uh, uh, I would probably say the ecological benefits are probably greater than the, the economic, although the economic benefits are there as well. And uh, it's also it's a beautiful tree, a like large, really large maple leaf. And, and uh, in 2010, -ish, people were reporting decline in big leaf maple. And uh, in fact, I just got an email the other day, just recently from someone saying, hey, I got my big leaf maples are dying. What's going on? And uh, and so DNR was was very uh, like after a while, it's like okay, yeah, I get an email. Then you know, as you all know, you get a couple emails in a row about the same problem. It's like okay, there might be something to this, and and that's what happened. They started looking at it, and they did see these patterns of changes in in big leaf maple. Uh, kind of the really striking one to me was the reduced leaf size. So, so if you look at the the really kind of like shrunken leaf syndrome almost, where the leaves got really really tiny and. And again, they first were thinking, well, there must be something going on biotically. So they did a survey. Uh, they surveyed starting in 2014, 2015, and they did what they call convenience sampling, where they just basically drove along the road and looked for a, a dead or dying big leaf maple. And the reason for that was not to sort of quantify the spatial pattern, but the original thinking was it was a pathogen. So they were looking for dead, dying trees, and they were taking samples so that they could look for pathogens. And they did. They, they used the, the center in Washington State at Puyallup as well as elsewhere. And uh, unfortunately, they never found any, any really consistent pathogen signs. 
Uh, just give you an idea of where they sampled. They sampled kind of all over the state, the at least the western side, uh, north, south, east, west, in western Washington. So they weren't, they were kind of driving all over the place looking for samples. Uh, again, there wasn't much of a signal with the samples. Uh, they also found that pretty much all sizes were, were affected, young trees, old trees. It wasn't like a size issue, again, which made them think it was probably more of a pathogen, given that a lot of insects like a tree borer is probably looking for a certain flown thickness, which means they're age specific. And this one looked like it was kind of all over the place. And so we looked at it again in 2017 and we did a random sample and found about a fourth of the sites had declining uh, big leaf maple. And again, it was kind of all over the place, you know, north, south, east, west, again, in, in the western uh, side. Didn't really see any uh, uh, obvious spatial pattern. It was like, oh, it's only in the cold areas, uh, at least not initially. We also noticed that it pretty much affected all age classes as well. So we also did the foliar tissue samples and the soil samples. Still didn't find any consistent pathogen uh, issue as well. Yeah, never, never found anything consistent. We'd find pathogens in healthy trees. We'd find no pathogens in dead trees. So really no connection there at all. What we did find was a, a pretty good connection with warmer, drier sites. Where we were seeing mortality had not, it didn't have as much to do with the biotic agents available, but it had more to do with the abiotic conditions. And we did see a, a trend significantly important trend in these warmer, drier sites. So this was definitely an abiotic driven phenomenon. We did some coring uh, to reconstruct the pattern and recognizing that you have trees that just like, I guess, people, we have good years, so we have bad years. Uh, there are good years for, for plant growth. There's, there's not so good years for plant growth. And when we did all the work, we also looked at Doug Fur to sort of uh, make sure we were understanding the climate signal. And what we found was it was indeed a pretty recent phenomenon. Like it was really occurring uh, more recently. We were, because a lot of these trees did not die. Uh, so we were able to go back in time. And we really found that across Western Washington, again, North, South, East, West, the decline was a very, very relative, uh, rel relatively new phenomenon. Again, in response to some of the drought conditions we all saw. So kind of a, kind of a summary, uh, published by my master's student, uh, Jake Jacob Benson. Uh, no, uh, pretty recent, uh, did have a signal with regard to climate, no biotic uh, conditions. And uh, we, when we did find biotic conditions or like a, like a pathogen or leaf hoppers, uh, we, we kind of think that, well, it was probably driven by those abiotic conditions because they just weren't consistent. So the abiotic factors can do two things. They can kill the plant directly, <laughs> but they can also open up a window of opportunity for whatever can come in. A little more to the story, <laughs> a few years later, another, another graduate student was on uh, campus and this is the UW campus and it was like Christmas in July where all these big leaf maples were just loaded with uh, powdery mildew. It's like, whoa, what's going on? There, it was everywhere. And we're like, where did this come from? And, and so we did a couple of studies. We looked at different species of maple. Uh, the ones in blue are native to North America. The ones that are underlined as well are native to uh, the Pacific Northwest. And the other ones are either commonly planted or highly desired, like Japanese maple, as well as the ones that are unfortunately commonly planted but not so desired, like Norway maple. <laughs> and uh, Big leaf maple was a particularly susceptible species to this pathogen of this powdery mildew. We still didn't know what it was at first, so we did a series of morphological and genetic studies. We found out there was one called Thabodea bicornis, which was like, oh, that's a new one, isn't it? Well, maybe. Um, we then did a kind of a reach out to some global partners, and we looked at um, different herbaria samples from which we could sequence powdery mildew. And it turns out we found that the highest variation, genetic variation was from Europe, which meant it probably had a European Eurasian origin. Not too surprising, a lot of our non-native species still come from Eurasia, uh, given the long history of colonialism. Uh, we also were able to detect it from a specimen from British Columbia from 1938, from an herbarium uh, sample. So that means it had been here for that many years and just waiting in the winds, waiting for his opportunity. Uh, and it found it when it had these drought conditions 
stressing out Big Leaf Maple. It finally found its moment to shine after sort of laying sort of dormant since 1938, never really been reported by anybody. It, it, it got its chance to, to thrive. And that's what happened. Uh, again, showing how climate change can sort of shift these conditions of susceptibility and allow for something that's basically unknown, right? <laughs> Just sort of there, no one knows about it because it's sort of at these really low levels, all of a sudden it gives it a chance to, to shine. I'll sort of leave with one more concept we're working on now. And this is this concept that we call biotic hotspots, where we start seeing uh, the potential presence of multiple different body agents converge in space and time. Uh, and when we look at it, and then what I mean by this is like you have a forest stand, maybe you have historically an outbreak of this species. Uh, a few years later, you have an outbreak of this species. And here's a case where they're both outbreaking at the same time. They're not competitors. They could be feeding on entirely different host plants. But are we seeing this pattern of conversions? And we looked at it, it looked like we were. We were actually seeing more and more spaces across the Western United States that were overlap, that had these overlapping agents. So what, what I mean by that is say you have a forest stand, you have two different species, uh, different age classes, the species are represented by the different colors of green. And you might have, well, here's an outbreak of a bark beetle, supposed to be a bark beetle. <laughs> Um, it only feeds on one species, bark beetles, particularly the tree killing kind are very, very specific. Uh, so it takes those out. But what you're left with is resiliency, right? <laughs> you're left with uh, an opportunity for that forest to change. And we like it to change in a manner that's gonna be uh, a good thing, <laughs> as the previous speaker said, uh, uh, with regard to fire, uh, but sometimes it doesn't. But we, and we do worry about changing that composition to something that may not be stable. Well, a hotspot, you might have two different species, again, not competing, actually attacking different hosts, and you might see a different look as a result. Maybe you can see different age classes being affected as well. And you can see how this might affect overall resiliency of the forest if you have these overlapping agents in space and time. So I'll sort of leave you just with one graphic because this is very statistical, but uh, what we found when we looked at both bark beetles and defoliators in the Pacific Northwest is that defoliators hadn't really changed their outbreak dynamics. In other words, they weren't getting more spatially extensive. They weren't really becoming more periodical. They were kind of doing the same thing through time. The colors, the, the bluer colors are more recent. But the bark beetles did have a pattern where they were becoming more spatially extensive in recent years. And we did this with and without mountain pine beetle. Uh, because we had data from British Columbia, which was basically all mountain pine beetle because of that outbreak. So, and we saw the same pattern. So it wasn't just mountain pine beetle driving this relationship. And what we think is going on is that uh, the foliator outbreaks are, are sort of doing their own thing. But if bark beetle outbreaks get larger, the, the probability of overlap becomes greater. And you start seeing this, this idea of, oh, now you have a forest stand being managed by someone where, oh, you have to deal with multiple agents at the same time. And that can be very uh, extensive work. <laughs> Outbreaks themselves can be very logistically challenging because they happen all at once or in a fairly short period of time. Uh, they completely overwhelm any natural enemies, right? Natural enemies are like us, they can only eat so much. And uh, they also reduce any kind of buffering in the environment if the whole area is being affected at the same time. That's just one outbreak. So if you start throwing on outbreak on top of each other, you can see how that could really affect uh, long-term forest resiliency. So with that, I'll just sort of stop. I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, a number of colleagues, including uh, three students who have finished their degrees with me, and I'll leave my contact information as well. Happy to answer any questions. I have one. Yeah. Um, as you were talking about insect movement and adaptive management, um, the, I might be totally off base here, but has anybody looked at insect movement to try to gauge how much, how far to move plants, like to bring yeah. that back because they're moving freely? That's a great question. So the question to do with, you know, as, as you think about assisted migration with plants, to look at how the insects might respond or how they might be a, 
indicator of what should move where? Yeah, uh, for yeah, for adjusting how much we move trees, yeah, yeah. thinking about that being about the the shift in climate. That's a great. I don't think anybody's looked at that. I think the the idea of assisted migration is still somewhat newish, and we're still learning about best way to do it. Uh, and they're probably thinking like the like Matt said in the previous speaker, different seed lots might perform different bed, you know, you know, the right seed for the right location. So I imagine the complexity of thinking about the insects that follow has not been addressed, but it's a great idea because um, uh, if it's a herbivore, it's going to follow the plant, but it also has to be in that climatic zone to survive. That's a good question. And you can to sort of follow up on that. If you have an herbivore that follows a plant, uh, that may not be a bad thing. Uh, but what if the natural enemies aren't able of that herbivore and aren't able to follow and, and suit? Then you really have uh, a, a, a native species acting in an invasive manner. So one of the features of it of, of insects that that might make them more invasive is that they're released from their natural enemies. It's called the enemy release hypothesis, uh, and that's one hypothesis that we have to explain why some species, not just insects, uh, thrive in new environments because their natural enemies are not there. We bring in the insect, we don't bring in the whole natural enemy community. Uh, so that would even be another interesting question. Well, if the insect can make it, can its natural enemies also survive those different climatic conditions? Uh, good, good question. Sounds like a research project. Yeah. That sparks another question in me is, have you done any work on like predatory flock, both like native and non-native and how those affect the insect dynamics? My my former, so the question was on sort of uh, national enemies, particularly the, the, the wasps, I assume the predators and the parasitoids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, my student, Alex Payne, who just finished his dissertation, did look at that in Eastern and Western Washington, and um, and he looked at it more in the lens of understanding um, uh, duck fur beetle outbreaks as well as well as Western fruit outbreaks on East and West side, and um, found a little bit of a pattern, uh, but it was a, sort of the opposite pattern than we expected. We actually found more of these natural enemies, which I guess kind of makes sense on the West side. Uh, uh, and I'm sorry, more, I'm sorry, more, more natural enemies on the east side and less so on the west side, which the reason why we thought that was a little bit odd is because we never really see outbreaks on the west side. And we know that the plants are probably getting more water <laughs> than they do on the east side. But we also have this idea that there, there tends to be more diversity in plants. And we thought, well, maybe the natural enemies are contributing. And it turns out they really weren't because they weren't as many as we thought there would be. Um, uh, they were actually were more common on the east side, uh, which is tends to be less diverse vegetationally or in terms of vegetation, um, but they actually had more of a diverse community there. So that's a situation where they're both within that climatic zone from, from the moment. The real question that could be that if, if Western Washington starts to look a little bit more like Eastern Washington with regard to drought, it will not have any natural enemy community or the same natural enemy community to contribute to any kind of checks and balances. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about avian species, mm -hmm. you know, like with the gypsy monk in Minnesota that came in. Do you know how that disrupted you know, their lives? Because oftentimes insects aren't at the same time. You know, babies are real. Yep. Yep. It looked like the Minnesota map, you know, see how Gypsy Mom came in and now it's kind of, you know, yeah. being out there. It's that native avians. Yeah, birds. Yeah, well, yeah, most, you know, like, so like 90% of birds require insects for their young, right? They might go to your bird feeder, but what they really want is those caterpillars. And that's why I sort of emphasize that. The loss of these caterpillars might be good if you're trying to keep your larch alive, <laughs> but it might not be so good for those other communities. And in in uh, lime tree at this part is a little bit unusual because um, one of the more I don't know of any any studies. I do know of one an informal study that looked at the black cat chickadees, and uh, and so what happened was. Um, uh, lime tree this part was actually displacing native caterpillars, particularly when they're competing on the same host. 
And but it was thought like, well, the birds will be fine. They can still eat them. But it turns out because um, spongy moth has these hairs, black cat chickadees don't really can't really process them as well. They're not as efficient. Um, whereas some of the ones that they're more likely to eat, like foresight cattle, a little bit less hairy, or what was the other one? Uh, the um, Oh, I'm drawing the geometry. I'm drawing a complete plane, but uh, they're more smooth skinned. And when and those, what they really want because uh, little bitty, bitty, little bitty black cap chickadees can process a smooth skinned caterpillar. They don't like the hairy ones as much. Um, so there was, what's that? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now, some of the bigger birds didn't care, they would just swallow them up whole anyway. But I remember seeing, I don't think it was, I think it was a thesis from the University of, of Minnesota. I don't know if they were published, but they did document some declines in black cat chickadees because uh, the spongy moth was displacing the larva that they really wanted. And it wasn't so much about the hairs on them, but they had to feed it to their babies. So you got these spines all over this caterpillar. That's, that's, tough. that's, that's the reason why they have those spines <laughs> as a defensive mechanism. But certainly could have ramifications if you sort of go from this piece to a nectar kind of situation. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. More susceptible? Great question. Yeah. I meant to, yeah. The question was as they move, uh, are their hosts basically evolutionarily naive? And when uh, President Clinton actually um, did an executive order in 1999, this sort of, which was kind of a invasive species, it informed the Invasive Species Council on a federal level. And one of the things that went in that definition was to recognize that native species could be invasive. And it was probably motivated by a mountain pine beetle in the Rockies in Colorado. Um, and the, the reason for that is like as, as it went up slope in Colorado, it started attacking white bark pine, which is thought to be as a high elevation pine and it's thought to not have that evolutionary history. So as it was going over the Rockies, it was going into the jack pine zone. Uh, historically, we think mountain pine beetle fed on lodgepole pine, maybe ponderosa pine. It's a pine specialist, so it feeds within pinus. But it was thought that jack pine was going to be uh, poorly adapted in terms of defensive properties. And, and if you look at the jack pine map, you know, it's all downhill from Alberta, right? I mean, once you, if you can survive Alberta in jack pine, you can survive in Michigan, northern Michigan jack pine. So the idea was like, well, this thing could just, as this corridor to the East Coast, you know, and this, jack pine is sort of exists in the US and in, in the, like New York, Upper New York, Michigan, and so forth. Uh, but it turns out that it actually, um, there's this hybrid zone that it was in first where jack pine hybridizes with lodgepole pine. So at the moment, it's still within that hybrid zone and they're still seeing some evidence of jack pine, um, the hybridized jack pine still being somewhat effective against mountain pine beetle outbreaks. Uh, However, it remains to be seen. It, another thing actually happened was that the outbreak was declining anyway as part of that process. Uh, and so, but there is, and they've done some feedling kind of testing that does suggest jack pine is not evolutionarily adapted to these mass attacks. So there is concern with the next outbreak cycle that it actually could be a, a very weakened host because it does not have those evolutionary adaptations. Now, one of the first things that looked at at Alberta was the jack pine toast, you know, right? Because it's not a native host, essentially. Even though the insect's native, that host plant's not native to that insect. Yeah. You know, that's the look at, like, sort of the general new species, like, right? Yeah, so under sort of endemic conditions, lodgepole pine does pretty well. Uh, but against when, um, when the populations are great enough, it doesn't matter. The, they just overwhelm. And there's there's a lot of dead beetles on dead lodgepole pine that were successfully um, crystallized in that amber, so to speak. Uh, or there's a lot of dead larvae under the bark that were were killed by those induced chemicals. But when the attacks are so great, the, the tree runs out of energy. Yeah, regardless. Yeah. So we're going over a bit. Oh, speaker. So you know. Sorry. 
Okay, but no, it's okay. We have a couple questions from the chat. Oh, okay. What are your thoughts on spotted lanternfly prevention for Washington State? It's a good one. Um, yeah, that's a. Uh, I've already seen the YouTube videos on spotted. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, was it, was it was spotted lanternfly, not spotted wing? So, yeah, they the this is a sap feeder, and they really uh, like a lot of sap feeders. They um, they they're feeding in sap, which is like poor nitrogen environment. Um, and so they have to they have to eat a lot of nitrogen or they have to eat a lot of sap to get nitrogen from that. So as a result, they're just pooping out honeydew, right? That's why aphids produce honeydew, um, which the ants said love. But anyway, uh, that's a tough one because um, I, I, I guess I guess that a good thing is um, I seen some concern. I seen one study that looked at it with regard to the wine industry because this, this will go after Vitus. And uh, fortunately for now, um, uh, our wine, our grape growing districts are in Eastern Washington for the most part. I mean, I'm sure they have showy grapes in, in, in Woodenville, but the grapes really come from the East side. And that climate is not thought to be very suitable for this particular insect, given where the insect is native to. Um, so that's a good thing. Now, it's not a good thing if you're living in Seattle and just going to be on your plants. Um, um, I don't think they really developed a trap yet for that. I'm not as up to date uh, other than colleagues that work with it. Um, I think it's more of a visual thing. But the problem is that um, you don't really see them until you see them in these large masses, unfortunately. Right? Um, I'm not sure what the best way to control for it is. I mean, uh, um, I'm not sure if I have a good answer for that. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I know the state's trying, State Department of Agriculture, but of course they're they're overloaded. Right? <laughs> they're they're trying to trap fill in the blank uh, every year. Uh, so yeah, sorry, then, I don't have a good answer. One more that I think will be relevant to a lot of us. In your opinion, should Oregon ash still be installed in restoration projects in light of the mm -hmm. emerald ash borer invasion? That's a very good question. Uh, yeah, there's a good chance we already have emerald ash borer in Washington, just based on uh, historical records from Michigan that showed it was there for five, six, seven years before they really documented killing trees in, in Detroit. Um, well, for, for, I mean, I think there are ways, I think St. Louis had a great model for dealing with emerald ash borer. Um, St. Louis has that arch, right? Even St. Louis arch. And if you've ever been there, it's, um, this, this was when I was there, I was there before Emerald Ash Borer, but it was this well landscape park. And, and landscape architects tend to have a different idea of, and I hope there's only landscape architects in the mm -hmm. So they tend to have a, maybe a different idea than we think about tree plantings ecologically, where they really like single species, even age, right? So here's this park planted with nothing but ash, <laughs> all the same age, all the same species. You know, no, no diversity, and uh, and what and they were like, we're screwed. <laughs> we spent this money doing this park, and what they did is they did it in a proactive way where they said, okay, let's mark trees we can save, and then replant with some diversity. And uh, so they you, that same approach could be used for organ ash. I mean, you're not going to be able to treat every ash. Uh, I think it still runs about what 300 bucks a tree per year. To inject them, uh, they you can inject it yourself now. They do it's you know not easy, but you don't have to buy the high tech injectors that the the companies have. So you can't a homeowner can do it without spending too much money. But you do have to be aware of what you can treat uh, over a long period of time. So I would say it's completely out, but. If you're going to be planting organ ash, you want might want to be thinking about well, how much money do you want to spend per year treating the trees? Um, and there may be like, well, maybe you should plant it, given that your budget I can handle, you know, treating X number of trees per year. Uh, if you don't work with that in the budget, yeah, organ ash is tough. They already know organ ash is highly susceptible. They did those studies back east where they looked at different species. Um, that's those. Anybody live in Seattle? In Seattle, maybe you've been on uh, 35th Avenue in Wedgwood, where it's from like 84th to 147th. This line with flame ash, which is a cultivar of uh, narrow leaf ash, highly susceptible. And I, I drive down that road thinking, everyone ash where we got here. This is going to really change the street because this whole street's lined with it. And uh, 
Um, it's a legitimate question. I wouldn't say ash is removed, but I would say that you do have to think about, uh, you will have to treat it. You will have to deal with it if you want to keep it. And there's a cost associated with that. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Okay.